Coming up on Tech News Today, will iPhones be banned in the U.S.? Windows 8 getting some free office bundling, but in which versions? And eBay wants to take you window shopping. We'll have more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, June 5th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used Samsung Galaxy, iPhone, and other smartphones are worth at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zachter. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting each time with the top 10 stories of the day in the news feeds. The U.S. International Trade Commission ruled Tuesday in favor of Samsung in a patent dispute with Apple regarding encoding and decoding of CDMA signals in iPhone and iPads. If upheld, a limited exclusion order would go into effect that would ban the AT&T models, oddly for a CDMA thing, of the iPhone 4, the iPhone 3GS, the iPhone 3, iPad 3G, and iPad 2 3G. Apple plans to appeal the decision to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Microsoft is adding a version of its Outlook email and calendar app to Windows RT. That's the ARM-based version of Windows 8. Previous devices, such as the Surface RT, came only with Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and OneNote, along with custom email and calendar program. Microsoft is also bundling Windows 8 and Office Home and Student onto 7-inch and 8-inch tablets with various PC manufacturers. Uh, one of them is Acer's Iconia W3, which retails for about $379. Microsoft has also put together an official preview video for Windows 8.1, and it doesn't mention the triumphant sort of kind of return of the start button. Pandora just launched tv.pandora.com, a platform that brings Pandora to TVs and set-top boxes using an HTML5 interface. The first devices to get access to tv.pandora.com will be the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3 through their web browsers. Pandora hopes this will let its users have a uniform experience regardless of the device. We're not sure what Samsung may have left for their June 20th announcement. Uh, they just announced the Galaxy S4 Active with IP67 water and dust protection. What that means is it supposedly can survive in three feet of water for up to 30 minutes. It can respond to touch in gloved hands and has an aqua mode setting for the camera. Phone is scheduled to launch in the U.S. and Europe this summer. Intel has officially dubbed the next version of its high-speed port Thunderbolt 2. It was previously called Falcon Ridge when first shown off at NAB back in April. Thunderbolt 2 is a controller chip that doubles the speed of the first-generation port, supporting up to 20 gigabit per second bi-directionally, meaning the cables could support something like a 4K video getting transferred and playing it on the screen at the same time. There's a new world's thinnest Ultrabook, and it's the Fujitsu Lifebook UH90-L. It's 15.5 millimeters at its thickest point, and it's powered by an Intel Haswell processor. The notebook puts a 14-inch display into a 13-inch form factor, and that display has a ridiculous 3200 by 1800 resolution. Oh, and it's a touchscreen. The UH90-L uh, will be available on June 28th would make a great birthday present, I'm just saying. Freedom Pop has a new freemium plan that charges you nothing for 500 megabytes of wireless data access, 200 voice minutes, and unlimited messaging starting later this summer. For an additional $10 a month, you can have unlimited voice as well. Freedom Pop has been a data-only plan, and that isn't changing. Voice calls will go over VoIP and text messages through Text Plus. The service runs on Sprint's network, currently WiMAX, but they say it'll be LTE in the future. Remember the Duo 11... You might be wanting to forget it. Well, yeah. Sony has announced the Duo 13 designed to improve upon the Duo 11. There's a new surf slider hinge that makes it easier to open. The 13 weighs slightly more at about 2.93 pounds, but has shrunken bezels, a carbon fiber design, and what Engadget calls a less cramped seeming keyboard with a real trackpad rather than an optical tracking stick. Hmm. 
A project from the University of Washington's Computer Science Department promises to be able to detect and recognize human gestures by watching how they affect the Wi-Fi signals in your home. Research on the system called YC has not been peer-reviewed yet, but will be presented at Mobicom in Miami in September. Researchers claim 94% accuracy even when gestures were performed in different rooms from the Wi-Fi antenna. In other words, you can gesture anywhere in your house to remotely control things. Yes, obviously, accidental gestures and security need to be addressed, but pretty cool. Reuters reports that Amazon will expand its Amazon Fresh grocery delivery service to San Francisco and Los Angeles this year. If those tests go well, Amazon will launch the service in 20 new markets in 2014. Amazon Fresh could go live in Los Angeles as early as this week. San, Fr San Francisco has to wait until later this year. Oh, good. More delivery interruptions during the show. That's awesome. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Do you want one of these, like the, that Active, the new Samsung Galaxy S4 Active, or maybe a HTC One for Verizon or the iPhone 5? Before you upgrade, make sure you sell your used phone on Gazelle. It's the easy way to turn it into cash. And, and what they do that's pretty awesome is they make it easier for you to lock in that quote right now, even if you're not sure when the phone you want is coming. If it's coming in the next 30 days, do it now. Go to gazelle.com, G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. Find your item. Tell Gazelle the condition. They'll even buy broken iPods and iPhones. Get a risk-free offer for your gadgets, and then you lock it in for 30 days. That's the cool thing. So gadget's probably not going to get more valuable over time. So you get that quote now, and then you have a month to figure out how to get your data off there, how to transfer things, buy that new phone, get all set up. Then you send them the old phone. And Gazelle is now buying back a larger selection of tablets. If you're like, look, I've got this old tablet I want to get rid of, not my phone. In addition to the iPad, you can now sell to Gazelle select Samsung, Google Nexus, Kindle Fire, Microsoft Surface, and Asus tablets. So don't wait. It's risk-free. Offers are good for 30 days. Payment is fast within a few days of the item being received. And they'll pay you by PayPal. They'll pay you by cash. Or you can get an extra 5% with an Amazon gift card. When I say by cash, it's check. They don't actually send cash in the mail. Only your, only your grandparents do that. Gazelle's going to send you money, though. It's trustworthy. They've paid $100 million to over 500,000 customers. I'm one of them. So find out what your iPhone, Samsung, and other Android smartphones are worth. Take a minute. Go to gazelle.com and find out. Sell your used Samsung Galaxy or iPhone today at gazelle.com. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us now to discuss the stories of the day, very happy to have Mark Millian, tech writer at Bloomberg, uh, joining us today. Welcome, Mark. It's good to have you back on the show, man. Thanks, Tom. Good to be here. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the iPhone ban. Uh, the Apple products are apparently infringing Samsung's U.S. patent uh, for CDMA encoding and decoding. Odd that the AT&T models of the iPhone are affected by this, but they are. So the International Trade Commission issued a limited exclusion order. Of course, Apple says they're going to appeal it, which means they have to go to federal circuit court to do so because the ITC is, is done as high as you can go with that. You have to take it to court now. And this is all part of the worldwide Samsung-Apple war that's going on. In fact, this one is a standards-based patent. If this were in Europe, you'd have FRAND considerations. But in the United States, uh, they can still get away with saying, no, they, they are violating our patent. We don't have an agreement. Uh, there's a separate patent violation that Apple is pursuing against Samsung. Now, the, the, the judge has found that Samsung violates Apple's patent at the ITC. That one has got a final decision due in August. So if I'm Apple, I'm probably trying to get this appeal kicked around until August and we get a decision. Are these guys ever going to settle down and just settle, Mark? And is, what's going to happen here? Is this going to last forever? Well, they might not have a choice. Uh, one of the X factors this week is uh, Pre President Obama coming out and you know talking about uh, potential crackdowns on um, and revisions to the U.S. patent system. Uh, one of the things he specifically called out um, in his presidential order was uh, was the ITC and, and sort of having a, a government body review how how the ITC uh, conducts their processes and to to you know kind of figure out if the system in place is the right one. He's also cracking down on patent trolls, but it, uh, relevant to uh, the Apple Samsung case, uh, what they decide on how the ITC will be able to run their processes could be relevant to this because a lot of these. Um, you know, multinational firms end up going through the ITC because it's a quicker process. 
Yeah, and and I, I, the big the big deal would be speeding up the the actual court process for this. And I, I know most of those are implemented against most of those changes the president is making are implemented against patent trolls, but it would make the ITC slightly less attractive to be played out. But these guys are going to find ways around all of this stuff. Their their whole point isn't actually to win or even to ban. Most of these bans never end up going into place. People find workarounds or they find resolutions before they actually get implemented. In fact, in this case, these products are so old, some of them are still being sold, but they're certainly not making up large amounts of sales for Apple. I as you know, this is this is the long running national international nightmare. What, what what do you see going on here? As long as the lawsuits are cheaper to do than actually licensing the patents, I think that's what's going to keep this thing going until eventually this will this has to burn out. I mean, patents have a finite life, so this has to end at some point. You'd think, but uh, I, I, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me that in the next five years, I'm going to say five year time frame, that there's finally a cross licensing agreement between these two because they do have a lot of overlapping technology, and Samsung and Apple do have a very long relationship. Uh, more of Samsung, you know, providing parts for Apple, and Apple tries to diversify as much as they can. But the thing is, Samsung has always been a very good supplier. So unless they somehow figure something out because they want their parts, Samsung parts, or they figure out a way to eliminate them, they need to somehow come to a peace and probably hopefully soon. Comscore says that there are more Apple devices being used out there. Samsung seems to be winning the market share analysis that come out from places like Canalys and Gartner. Uh, Sarah, th these two are not going to be making peace anytime soon, are they? No, I don't think so. At the same time, although I agree that Apple's not just going to say, okay, we lose, we're tired of it, let's do something else, um, that, because that's not how Apple nor Samsung operates. Some of these models, honestly, it's 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 not as if if you own a first gen iPad, it's going to get taken away from you. They, they, would, they would just not be allowed to sell more. And quite frankly, these models are so old, I can't see Apple losing a lot of sleep over that. I mean, they're pushing next generation of iPads and iPhones, and and we all assume this will be one of those years. So. It really is more of a, you know, Samsung saying, okay, well, wh where, what can we do to Apple that's going to hurt just to kind of keep this whole thing alive? So the upshot is a lot of stuff going on in the world of patents, but frankly, you're not going to see things disappear from shelves, just like you almost never see things disappear from shelves. Let's right. talk about something you are going to see showing up on your Windows machine, which is Windows 8.1. We we got some new details and even a video about it, IS. Yeah, Computex, though, at Windows CFO Tammy Reller was talking about how the new Windows tablets, the small tablets, are going to be bundled with Office Home and Student 2013. It's going to be up to the OEM to bundle the software, which would include Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and OneNote, no Outlook 2013. And the tablets that will be uh, will have these pre-installed are under 10-inch devices. So if it's over 10 inches, you're not getting the software. And the 8-inch Acer Iconia W3 is the first one pre-installed with uh, with Office for that low price of 380 bucks. And there was the announcement that Outlook RT is finally coming to Windows RT, and that's with Windows RT 8.1. Now, Windows RT already had a version of Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, and another calendar program that seemed a little strange since there was Outlook and there's also this calendar program. So next year, or not next year, when 8.1 comes out, Outlook RT will be, be there. Mark, do you think a bundled version of Office uh, is going to move smaller tablets faster than if it wasn't there at all? I think uh, Microsoft is pulling out everything from the classic playbook in the hopes of making this work. And so Office has worked for them in the past, and, and the hope is that this will, uh, this will help spur sales. I think, you know, for a lot of businesses, it does help. Um, I, I know that uh, many business executives get frustrated that they don't have the full Office suite on the iPad and would love a way to be able to... Uh, to access Outlook and Word and and get that full experience on their tablet, um, but I mean, one of my one of the questions that I have is why did this take so long? I mean, my, Microsoft, you know, put many of their eggs into the, this Windows 8 tablet basket and didn't have Outlook for for many many months until after it came out. Seems a little strange to me. Tom, do you find it odd that the smaller devices are getting Office on top of it? It seems like Office would be better for a larger screen, not necessarily a sub-10 inch experience. Yeah, I, I mean, it's definitely a, a, a way of saying, hey, we can give Office and, and make some headlines and sound good, but don't give it to anything where it's useful because we want those people to pay still. 
Uh, yeah, you give it to the small things because that's something somebody's less likely to buy. So you bundle it in there. It's 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 less risk, more reward there. I, I agree with Mark. I mean, the, Microsoft is trying to pull out all the stops. I was watching that Windows 8.1 video earlier today, too. None of those things are changing my mind about Windows. And I'm not even a Windows 8 hater. I think it's going just fine. But the tweaks they're making there, none of, none of them are addressing things that I was really upset about in Windows 8 at this point. Now, I was not one of those people that was dying for the start button back. I'd like the start menu. Maybe that apps thing is a little cool. But yeah, this this is this is maybe moving the deck chairs around on the Titanic a little bit. Sarah, what do you make of Microsoft's move? Does this mean that we'll never see Office on any other platform since they're going to be including it on these small Windows tablets? Well, you know, the small tablets, not just Windows oh. tablets, but tablets in general, I mean, that's making up a bigger market share of, of, of the tablet market than... Than, than it was before, partly because you just have more tablets to choose from. But, I mean, the smaller form factor seems to be a hit with consumers. So I don't know that I would necessarily say, oh, Microsoft is just adding these features to tablets that people won't want Office on. I think that uh, increasingly people are going to not only want Office on smaller tablets, but be using it and it'll seem normal and fine. So, yeah, I mean, I guess it's limiting. I I'm... I'm sort of with Tom. It's 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 not that anything that's really being offered is something that was glaringly missing, in my opinion. But um, but yeah, Microsoft's just trying to make things look more attractive. Two things I will say: I don't think Microsoft is the Titanic. I just said this is akin to moving the the, the deck chairs around. Uh, and the other thing I would say is that. I'm not that mad at Windows 8. The one thing that they are putting in Windows 8.1 that I like is they'd be able to boot straight to the desktop. Well, I'm, I'm just really surprised at how low cost these 8-inch tablets are going to be. They're going to be running Intel processors inside. These are full Windows 8 machines. The whole RT experiment seems to be kind of a mess. That rumor that RT is going to cost less money, so you might see cheaper uh, sub-10-inch tablets as well. That might move those... But I'm, I'm really curious of how Microsoft's going to position these things as productivity tools because these are full-fledged computers. They might look like a tablet, but that's still, the desktop is still there. If you wanted to boot into the desktop on the Diconia, you could. seems a little strange considering it's a, it's a mini tablet there at 8 inches. But I think this price point thing is it might get the sluggish sales of PCs moving because these are PCs. All right, let's talk about eBay putting window shopping in. What, what does that mean, Sarah Lane? Well, they call it virtual shopping, and it's sort of like that. What eBay is doing, it's a bit of an experiment. They're putting four, basically, screens um, in New York City. They'll be live from June 8th through July 7th in areas of New York that, you know, have a lot of foot traffic. Uh, Soho and Lower East Side are two neighborhoods. And each screen will be about nine feet across and two feet high and will appear on the front windows of stores that aren't actually open right now. The, the experiment, the first four screens, will each show 30 items from a new fashion brand launching this year called Kate Spade Saturday. So maybe it's, you know, a little <laughs> bit more of like a ready-to-wear version of Kate Spade. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but new sort Kate of a spin-off brand. Kate tops or something? I don't know. Okay. Something like that. Yeah, sure. What, whatever you wear on Saturday if you like Kate Spade. So what you do as a shopper is you walk by the store, whatever store that, that, that this, this, this display is a part of that's closed, you look at these, these 30 items if you like one of them, you, you're able to touch the screen and order the product and then have the product delivered to you within an hour via courier. Sound familiar to anybody? This is a, it's a hot market right now. A payment will be accepted by the couriers through PayPal here. PayPal, of course, owned by eBay. So this is a sort of a virtual, you know, wallet uh, payment service as well. Steve uh, Yankovic, who's the head of company innovation and new ventures group over at eBay says... This extends the boundary of the store. Suddenly, the physical store, by virtue of online technology, extends to any space that's interesting to use. What's also interesting is that as a new brand, you can kind of try out and see if there is a lot of consumer interest without actually putting together any physical retail space. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Mark, what do you think? Do, do you think that this is, uh, this is sort of the, the next step? We're kind of bridging together the virtual store um, by by attaching it to existing stores? Um, I mean, this is a gimmick, but it's not a bad one, actually. Um, I think, you know, this potentially opens eBay up to the, uh, 
the Fifth Avenue shoppers who wouldn't necessarily think to go there for fashion or or most other goods. Many people uh, in the mainstream still think of eBay as just sort of like the place where you go for for online auctions. And they've shifted a lot of their focus to more of an Amazon model. So um, I think in that in that case, it kind of makes sense for them to try to reach out to this crowd of shopper who doesn't think to go online for their clothing and may just walk down the street. But this is not, I don't expect this to show up in every city and every town. Um, I don't think they would have a, a courier service in uh in Iowa to support the infrastructure there, but it's, it's a smart gimmick and, um, it'll be interesting to see if this opens them up to any new customers. Do you think this changes the kiosk situation in malls instead of having the guy with all of the iPhone cases, they just put up a screen. (laughs) Uh, I, 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 those guys can be very annoying, so I wouldn't be too, too sad to see them go. But yeah. not as bad as the the woman squirting the perfume in your face. Well, but, but one of the nice things I think is that you don't actually need, and and it's true that those people are um, they're kind of aggressive because they're supposed to be, so that uh, they get your attention. But to not have to really put together anything that's physical. I mean, you don't have to sign a lease on a big building. You you might be able to try out new brands that. Maybe they maybe they've got a future, and maybe the public doesn't respond. So there's no reason to invest a lot more money into um, uh, products that that people don't want to buy. Ayaz, do you think that eBay is the right company to partner with these these fashion brands, or as Mark said, is it a little bit odd since people still think of eBay as an auction service? I, I think eBay might be a good company to start this with. You know, the thing is. People know that eBay at least sells stuff, and when you see that it's powered by eBay, but they're using uh, high-end companies like Kate Spade, or they're working with with her, that's a big deal. I I just think there's a strangeness when it comes to this idea of window shopping, when it comes to fashion or or bags and things. If you're walking around outside, there's a good chance when you look at a window and you're like, oh, that's a nice display. You usually go in to test and you know and and have that tactile experience. Uh, you're not going to get that with this kind of. Uh, this kind of gimmick. So it seems like it'll be nice to see. It, it, it almost, it just seems more like an interactive ad to me than anything else. So I don't know if it's really spectacular in the fact that eBay is kind of advertising instead of being a, a storefront. Uh, but I, I just, I just don't see this being like getting a lot of traction for eBay because it's just basically an interactive ad. Yeah, I think you guys are right. It's 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 a uh, both you and Mark that it's a marketing ploy, right? It's a gimmick. It's it's a fun gimmick. It's not a bad gimmick. Uh, and and maybe my joke about kiosk would end up solving some of the problems where you you would have the screen and the person. Unfortunately, it wouldn't get rid of the aggressive salesperson, but you could then have some <laughs> physical models to try out and then order it. Uh, you may be in a different color from the screen, something like that. All right, uh, not to get off shopping, uh, Amazon has had a grocery delivery service in Seattle since back. We covered the launch of it on Buzz Out Loud at CNET. That's how long ago it was, like five years ago. Amazon Fresh now finally coming out of Seattle to Los Angeles, possibly later this week, according to sources talking to Reuters, uh, and definitely to San Francisco sometime in 2013. I say definitely according to those sources. Uh, The source is also saying they're targeting 20 more markets for 2014. They want to expand to 40 markets eventually. And the idea is that they have a big warehouse uh, that will have refrigerated areas for food, space for nearby to, to stores, up to 1 million general, general merchandise products, and they're going to web van it. That's what they've been doing in Seattle. They've, I guess they've figured out how to do it. Uh, you order online from Amazon, your groceries get delivered. Now, this goes up against a bunch of other services, including Instacart in San Francisco, which has been expanding their service to other parts of the Bay Area. They go to stores like Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, places like that, and they bring that stuff to you. So they think they have the advantage because they don't have to have the warehouse. Uh, but there's also Walmart with Fresh Direct, bringing it from the stores, and Peapod still exists. I used Peapod like back in 1998 in Austin to have like, I don't know, I think it was Albertsons uh, groceries delivered or something. There, there is still the largest grocery delivery service online in the United States. In the dark shadow of web vans, uh, nightmarish failure in the early part of the 2000s, Mark, it, can Amazon succeed? Um, yeah, I mean, they actually uh, have a model that conceivably works. I mean, they already have these warehouses in many states um, to to house all of the 
other products that they sell, if they can cut um, some sweetheart deals with farmers to get low price produce and with the uh, with the grocery distributors to get um, to get discounts on groceries, then yeah, this could conceivably work. And I am pumped. I mean, I've I've become a total Amazon Prime convert, and you know, adding groceries to the mix would eliminate the just terrible trips to Safeway that I hate making and trying to press my thumb against avocados to figure. I have no idea how to pick out avocados. <laughs> but Amazon needs to pick out my avocados. Outsource the avocado picking. I, I, I you know, I, I get a vegetable delivery box. It's not uncommon uh, for the same reason. Like that way, the people who actually know vegetables give me good vegetables, and I get really good vegetables that way. But I don't know about the centralized versus distributed. I kind of like what Instacart has, where you can say, "Oh, I want the Trader Joe's yogurt or whatever it is you like. Oh, I want the Whole Foods bagels or something." I ask, don't you think that gives them an advantage? Uh, you know, I, I think what gives Amazon an advantage is the fact that people are used to shopping with them. And, and if you found out that if you were buying out on a Tupperware and they say suggested, hey, by the way, you can get some you know, fresh cherries, uh, we can give you that. That'd be kind of neat. And, and the crazy thing is, you know, I'm just thinking Amazon can pull this off because they're not just selling groceries, right? They can, if you buy something expensive and they have higher margins, they can sustain this kind of uh, this kind of business model. Whereas if you're just doing groceries, that's not very, it's not a high margin kind of business. So, if if Amazon sells you a a uh, an AV an AV receiver with your your new celery or something, I think that's going to go well for them. It's just another thing when you think about Amazon of what can I buy there? Pretty much anything. One of the reasons I stopped doing online grocery ordering is because I had to be around for the delivery. Uh, and, and back in, in, at least in San Francisco, I, that was always as big of a problem as trying to get to the grocery store, Sarah. Do you, how big do you think the demand for grocery delivery is going to be? This is a low-margin well, business, after all. Yeah, it's interesting that it's launching in larger cities. Uh, obviously, you have more people there, but at the same time, I think cities are, you know, it depends which city we're talking about, but there are a lot of fresh produce stores within a few minutes walk of me where I live right now. So I don't really like the idea of getting what I consider to be fresh produce, stuff that's grown locally at Amazon. That's, I don't put the two together. Now, if Amazon can promise me, hey, you know, if you order eggs, depending on what your zip code is, we'll be sure to um, uh, deliver you eggs from the nearest, you know, accredited poultry farm, you know, up in Petaluma. That's usually where they come from. But I don't, you know, that's that's not really what Amazon's going to be doing. The bigger the warehouse, the more that that's just not the case. So I think when it comes to most things that Amazon sells, Amazon is amazing. You know, any Prime user will say so. When it comes to fresh food, it gets a little different for me. And yeah, I mean, Tom, you mentioned that you get this vegetable delivery. I mean, that's probably put together by a bunch of people who can tell you all about the farms and the people who grow the strawberries that you got. Right. And that's why those services work really well, because uh, they're unique and you're supporting local farmers and that sort of thing. So... Yeah, I think I think this is probably going to be great for a lot of people, maybe who don't have access to farmers markets and fresh produce, and, and there there is a market there. I I don't know that I am it. All right, let's shift gears a little bit uh, to bringing music to your television. We always talk about video services, but there's a battle on for music delivered through your set top box attached to your television as well. Pandora is trying to elbow into there, right, Ayaz? Yeah, so today Pandora launched a new platform called tv.pandora.com. supposed to make it easier to get Pandora on your TV or your set top box. And the platform right now available on the 360 and the PlayStation 3 if you use your web browser. Partnerships with TV makers are still in the works. Now, obviously, Pandora is on a lot of set-top boxes already, but tv.pandora.com is based on HTML5, so it's supposed to be compatible with standards-compliant TVs and set-top boxes. You know, a lot of these smart TVs coming with browsers and things like that. Uh, Pandora's CTO, Tom Conrad, says the standards make it easier for Pandora to experiment with ads to find out what works on TVs. Now, Pandora says that more than one-third of its users listen to the music service at home, and Pandora right now is available on over 900 electronics devices. Mark, does a TV strategy make sense for Pandora? Do you listen to radio on your TV? Oh, yeah. I know, I know just from talking to those guys, the TV is a huge um, 
you know, source of usage for the service. Um, but I think that is going to continue to come from, you know, integration with Samsung TVs and, you know, apps that are installed on these set top boxes. Um, just people, people don't want to fiddle with a web browser on their TV. And, and I don't think they're going to get a ton of usage from people, you know, finding the web browser built into their, their set top box or web TV, typing in pandora.com or tv.pandora.com on their remote control and, and navigating there. Well, this allows them to maybe experiment with the, uh, with the, the high end, you know, early adopter user and, and kind of do some clever things with advertising. I don't think this is going to be kind of, kind of reach the mainstream. Sarah, do you think this is going to put Pandora on more on more platforms like they're trying to do? The thing is, they've made applications for like LG TVs, the Roku, all these things. They're inconsistent because you have to write specifically for those devices. Do you think this is going to have a nice uniform experience on lots and lots of devices? I think it'll make it a lot easier. Um, I, currently, I I use my Pandora app on my Ro my Roku box here and there. Um, I also access Pandora through my Sonos interface. But if I could access Pandora easily through, well, I probably can on, on my television. But if it could be available on more televisions, especially with those of us who have a somewhat decent speaker system set up with our TVs, and in many cases... That's the way that we'd listen to music if we were to in our homes. It makes perfect sense. There's also, you know, you kind of think of like Pandora, but that's radio. What do you need the TVs for? Well, you got album art, you've got song lists. There, there are a variety of visual things that are actually kind of cool when you when you bring it into the the TV experience. Not just if you're having a party and people can kind of look over and see what's playing, but it kind of gives you something to look at. So I think this makes perfect sense. Well, maybe I'm just the old man here because I, I don't bother to keep a radio on my television. I think it's just a waste of electricity. Tom, what's your opinion about this? You're the old man. Thanks. You're the oldest man ever. I, I No, I'm the same way. I actually don't listen to any, any music through my television. It's all through my car or on headphones. But I, I know lots of people who do this, obviously. I know Sarah and I know Mark. So they, this is not <laughs> unusual. But... I think it's a scramble right now for these services to figure out what platforms they need to be on, where they need to be. I, I think if I were Pandora or Ardio or Video or Voodoo or any of these services, I would be dying for somebody to come up with the one solution or, or at least the one or two solutions. So there's some competition uh, that, that I can engineer for because... Right now, you have to like, oh, I have to make an Xbox version, I have to make a PlayStation version, and a Roku version, and maybe I should do a Western digital version. I don't know, and it, it's it's just a it's just kind of a nightmare. I'm definitely a fan of the fact that they're going to go with the HTML5, and that would make it more available on other platforms because the, the smart TVs they do have their own app stores, and they're all just kind of all over the place. If it's just browser based, while that doesn't seem like a lot of fun, I will agree with Mark there. I don't want to be typing in tv.pandora.com on, on on a remote or an on-screen keyboard. So it's it's uh, it might allow more people to get it and you have that uniform experience, but I don't know how much usage it's going to get unless uh, people really love apps. And they just want to do that instead. That's your only choice on a lot of these things, like an Xbox, for instance. So, I don't know. Can you can you pin it? Is that going to work? Yes, you should be able Xbox? to pin on Xbox. Yeah, so it'll, it'll be essentially the same thing. All right, uh, let's uh, move along to the members of the IATA, the World Airline Industry Organization, coming up with their own way for you to book travel. Is this a good or a bad thing, and for whom, Sarah? Well, I think if all goes well, it's going to be a great thing for consumers, you know, the the lowly people who have to sit in the seats and, 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 and suffer through air travel. Yeah, so the IATA met in Cape Town, South Africa this week and passed resolution approving a new standard called New Distribution Capability. I don't know how they name these things. The whole point of it, though, is to give consumers the same online experience, whether they're shopping for travel uh, directly through the airline that they're thinking of going through, or they're using some other sort of online service, think Kayak or Hitmunk or, or that sort of thing, or going through a travel agent that they trust, et cetera. Currently, airline websites show info uh, to you that they can't really share with third-party sellers. For example, if I go to United right now and I'm looking, you know, at a trip to New York, I can see a fare that's low because it's non-transferable. Then I might see another fare that has some sort of like, oh, I've got a seven-day window and, you know, in order to exchange the ticket. So you've got these tiers that you can get through the airline itself 
And it's not the same experience um, if you try to use one of these third-party services. Now, if this all goes down, this would basically be updated software. The software that is in use right now is, in, in some cases, about 40 years old. Could be rolled out within two years if the airlines cooperate. And obviously, they'd have to. Hmm. The pi uh, there's a pilot demonstration with actual transactions that's uh, planned for October of this year in Dublin, uh, where the World Passenger Summit is happening. Sounds like a rollicking good time. Now, you might say, well, why would this ever be a bad thing? You know, let's all get everybody on the same page. Uh, anybody who's done a lot of online booking travel knows that it could be a lot more seamless. Uh, some travel information technology companies, Sabre Holdings, Travelport, are both companies that make money by linking airlines to agents because of these aging distribution systems that are using outdated technology. Obviously, they would lose business, so there's a bit of pushback. But again, it's you know, that's that's always the way it is because these are these are sort of uh, stopgap measures that are in place because technology is not. Mark, I don't know how much travel you do. Um, I just got back from a trip uh, to New York, and I can I can definitely see uh, a huge huge market for improvement um, in 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 the technology that we use to book travel. What do you think about this? That is for sure. Uh, now, is this like a uh, is this a response to Google buying ITA somehow? Is there, are they sort of setting the pieces to have another option? I think this is more of a if you as a consumer book through the airline directly, that's great. But the airline misses out on giving you more options if you were to book through anything. Yeah, anything that Google would offer or. Uh, other third-party services. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, if they, you know, if they get this right, then kudos to them. Um, air travel is a pain, and booking it is a pain, and every, you know, going through security is a pain. So, any improvements to the process? Mm -hmm. I like personally using Hipmunk, which I think you know has uh, created a, a pretty compelling service. It's not the prettiest interface but it's like a truck it's a it's a pretty good utility for for kind of seeing all your options and getting everything done but yeah i would definitely be interested to see what they come up with um, these industry trade groups typically aren't the most design savvy and don't come up with the most elegant solutions but um, it's you know i i look at something like isis from the carriers or uh, as as an example of that, uh, the mobile wallet that they're working on to compete with Square and Google Wallet. But uh, we'll see what the industry can do. I'll keep an eye on it. Where everybody has I, to travel. I doubt the airlines are going to cooperate with this. Is the problem they want to have that special information at the site? They resist you going to the Travelocities and the Hip Monks and the Hot Wires of the world. In fact, you know, the airlines like Southwest don't even cooperate with those places. They don't even put their fares on there. So this is sort of counter to the interest of the airlines. I'm skeptical it's going to catch on. But why, Tom? I mean, do, the airlines want to, they, they they want to book their flights. In some cases, they'd like to overbook them. Uh, so if, if, if we have a growing uh, uh, number of services, Hipmunk being one of them, I like Hipmunk as well. That's usually where I start. <laughs> that can help United Airlines fill that flight from here to London. I mean, what do they have to lose? Money. It's, well, I, but that's, I, I, but the, because these the services one thing are they, helping them get my money. But the one thing they, that I think the bigger problem for them is collecting fares versus actually filling seats. And what the reason that Southwest doesn't allow these other companies to do the booking for them is they want to keep all the money. They don't want to share it with anybody. And that's why airlines like United and American are doing special fares on their websites because they want to entice people to say, hey, just book with us. A, you get to keep all the money. And B, if people are having to go to the individual airlines, they're less likely to fly on competing airlines. They may just decide, ah, well, American Airlines always goes where I'm going, so I'll just book on them all the time. I asked, what do you think? Do you think, uh, do you think air travel is horrific enough that we need something like this? Or can, can the airline industry exist on really, really old technology for a while? I think anything that makes the consumer experience better is, is just 
flat out, uh, it's just good for everybody. Because the thing is, you when when you start to book a trip and you're trying to figure out where's what's going on, you're on something like Hipmunk, which has that great thing of uh, doing the it checks the trips by agony. That's the way I always sort mine because of the layovers and such. The fact that there aren't there not every airline is on there is kind of annoying. And like Tom was saying with these websites, yeah, they want you to keep using their websites and they want you to keep going back. But when that website screws up, like I think Virgin America did this a couple of months ago or maybe a year ago, their entire system was recoded and they had to redo everything and they gave everybody a bunch of points because their systems were outdated. If 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 they're going to bother to be standardized and everybody has the same kind of systems, hopefully that kind of stuff doesn't happen. And you might be actually be able to get your data uh, in a way that is understandable. That's another thing. When it comes to these airline websites, it's like like tax forms sometimes. It's just not pleasant. It's like tax forms. There you go, airlines. That's what you're like. All right, let's uh, let's let's change the subject to cute animals in the random. We have a dog story. A company called Whistle has come up with a canine fitness tracker. You can pre-order it now for $100. It attaches to your dog's collar, and then it keeps tabs on your dog's activity. It's kind of like Fitbit for dogs. And then you can uh, uh, supposedly share this information with your vet uh, and, and improve your dog's health. But not to leave Sarah out, a uh, cat has been helping Russian prisoners smuggle mobile phones and chargers in and out of a prison at Penal Colony Number 1 in Komi Province, Russia. So there you go, folks. Dogs trying to be healthy. Cats helping prisoners. Wait, is that, is that slanting My it goodness. too much? Well, <laughs> the poor mm. cats. They're getting these things taped to them. Well, they're yeah. not going to carry them, Tom. What you, how else do you think they're going to move these phones? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cats don't really, you know, like things like being told what to do. So I, I wonder how they threaten them. You walk in there and you give him that cell phone. Meanwhile, Mark and I have dogs. I'm, I'm certainly uh, concerned with my dog's health. <laughs> it's pretty much just Are you going to get your dog a, a fit bark? She, right now it would register nothing if I, <laughs> if I attached it to her. Is this a live shot or is this a still? Uh, no, that's live. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I thought you just said, I thought Jason had called up a picture. I'm like, that's, oh, there we go. That's a mover. There we Jango. go. Still. Well, you know, right. the, the actual f fitness of pets is very important. And the thing is, if uh, they can develop diseases, if they're overweight. So this kind of thing is kind of overdue. I'm surprised this didn't exist, especially with all the wearable technologies we've seen with, uh, with you know, Fitbits and, and, and Nike Fuel Bands. It's just, you know, is your other dog, if you have more than one dog, are they going to try to bite that one off? I think it's better, better be resistant. And it's 100 bucks. It is, better be strong. Is this a growing trend? I mean, where, wearable technology is big. Are we soon going to see Google Glass for pets? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> huh? I'm just saying. Could are you going to get a whistle for your dog, Mark? Uh, no, I think he's plenty fit enough. He's um, puppies tearing up furniture behind me right now. So right. he's keeping himself busy. Sony does have an action cam with a dog mount, so that actually is a thing. Oh, okay. So if you, right. if you, if you, it's almost like Google Glass, yeah. except it's a, it's on their back. <laughs> it's like GoPro, mm -hmm. I guess. right? Yeah. I was actually at a uh, barbecue recently, and the little it was a French bulldog. In fact, Mark, uh, the little All bulldog right. was wearing a GoPro around her neck. So we were, you know, eventually I don't I don't know where the video is. It'll be on the internet eventually. You know, you get the like small little dogs version of what the party was like. <laughs> That's nice. pretty awesome. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, lots going on with the calendar. Let's check in. Yeah, it's a big calendar today. The Web London uh, starts today, has started actually, and runs through tomorrow in London, obviously. Also tomorrow, Inside Social Apps Conference is taking place in San Francisco. Tomorrow as well, the BlackBerry Q10 comes to Verizon. Uh, also tomorrow, Google Mebo Bar is no longer going to be active, so... Got one more day. And finally, Microsoft is launching Azure Cloud Computing Services in China also tomorrow. Looking ahead to June 11th, Facebook is going to webcast its first ever stockholders meeting. Nice. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. Oh my gosh, it's an email from Alex. Hello, TNT crew. In a show in show 767, you continue the discussion about a possible Lenovo BlackBerry business merger, specifically mentioning U.S. government customer customers as a reason. I am a private contractor working exclusively for a government agency, and it seems to me that something was missed by the discussion. The federal government's recent ban on computer hardware purchases from Chinese firms. The latest budget resolution 
HR 933 Section 156A bars select agencies, but not others, from purchasing any IT system produced, manufactured, or assembled by one or more entities that are owned, directed, or subsidized by the People's Republic of China because of cyber espionage fears. As best as best any of the higher-ups in our agencies can determine, this means all computer hardware currently in existence. So we've had a complete freeze on all <laughs> IT purchases, period, for the last month. In addition to this being a terrible setback for the important work that we and other departments are doing, I don't know how current hysteria will affect a potential Lenovo-Blackberry merger. Presumably, if they are thinking about one, they may have some way around the current Chinese hacky, hacker boogeyman problem the U.S. is currently facing. Yeah, we were just positing a BlackBerry Lenovo merger as one possibility. We're not even saying it's likely, but that that is going to be a problem for Lenovo in the U.S. market. Uh, Lenovo is weird too. They are not owned by the People's Republic of China. They were started after a grant from one of the the uh, science academies, which is uh, which is run by the government. So I, I guess they fall afoul of this regulation, but they're fiercely independent. They actually have their corporate headquarters in North Carolina. Uh, and so they're they're trying to be multinational, essentially, but they still have their roots in China. So who knows? Got an email from Brian, who's uh, he's posing a bit of a math question. He says, what does it mean if Intel's new chip consumes 4.7 times less power than their old chip? If I jogged a mile yesterday and then today I jogged four times less than yesterday, doesn't that mean that I jogged negative three miles? You know, <laughs> one minus four. Equals negative three. Yes. Uh, <laughs> this has been confusing many people. A lot of people think, ah, you shouldn't believe this crap Intel's putting out there. Let's, uh, if you can, Jason, put up the slide where Intel says the 4.7 times less power uh, than the previous Saltwell architecture. They're referring to the Silvermont architecture. Uh, it, it's basically saying for the same performance. So if you keep performance constant, you're using 4.7 times less power than Saltwell did. I guess the equivalent jogging metaphor would be you run a 5K, but you need to eat 4.7 energy bars to make it through the run. Uh, but then you become, have salt, you have Silvermont muscles in your legs, and then you only need to eat one energy bar to make it through the run. So it's 4.7 times fewer energy bars to make it through the run. Uh, there's certainly room to argue whether this power savings is as significant as Intel claims it is. In fact, there's a big, long uh, forum post on Anantech where people are debating exactly that. Uh, but it's not the math. And we'll see if it's even realized in practice, frankly. I mean, we, we haven't seen this thing in the wild yet. Thanks for the email, Brian. And thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. Mark Million, thank you for joining us. Great to have you on the show, man. Thank you. It was fun. Uh, you're working for Bloomberg these days, one of our stalwarts. We rely on you guys all the time for good information. Uh, let folks know where they can find your work and where to follow you and all that stuff. Awesome, yeah. Uh, a little over a month ago, we launched a new section on the site called Bloomberg Global Tech. Uh, it's at Bloomberg.com slash Global Tech, and it's you know specializing in uh, the 57 million square miles outside Silicon Valley. Um, there's a lot of good innovation happening in South Africa and Tel Aviv, and we're trying to to document all the all the cool stuff that they're doing overseas. That's excellent. Um, so, That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. We've got uh, dozens of reporters overseas who are helping out with it, covering, uh, you know, got the boots on the ground, covering startups and uh, R and D labs, all the great stuff over there. So Bloomberg.com/slash Global Tech is that right? Yep. Yep, check it out, folks. That's cool stuff going on there. Thanks again, Mark. Thanks. That is it for us. You can find our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. Of course, uh, that is where you can submit stories for consideration. That's where we got the cat story. TVZ got and submitted that today. Uh, you can also vote on the stories, vote them up or down. The number of votes helps affect whether we're like, oh, people seem to be really interested in this. Helps us make the lineup every day. Technewstoday.reddit.com. Don't forget about our hangout coming up next Wednesday, June 12th, 4.30 p.m. Pacific. We'll just be brainstorming about the show if you want to join us then. And uh, you can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. Email us TNT at twit.tv or give us a call. Leave us a voicemail 260-TNT-SHOW. Patrick Norton from TechZilla. And of course, uh, This Week in Computer Hardware joins us tomorrow. We'll see you then.